Well, it's preaching time. Thank you, young people, for that beautiful song. We're going to be in the book of Romans this morning, chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. When you find your place, I'll ask you to stand out of respect for the Word of God. Romans chapter number 8. Let's start in verse number 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature awaiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. I want to preach this morning on this thought, while we wait. While we wait. Father, I pray that you would take the word of God. Take the message. Have your will and way in our hearts and in our lives. I pray that you would allow me to be able to remember the things that I've studied and the things that you wanted me to communicate and make God's people be encouraged and strengthened and blessed. If there's somebody here today that's not saved, does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, I pray that they would before it is too late. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I want to begin the message this morning by saying that I'm waiting for Jesus to come back. How about you? Are you waiting for him to come back? And I was looking at these verses, and we're going to look at them in depth this morning, and other verses that talk about how natural it is for a child of God to look for Jesus to come back. It's a natural thing. In fact, Paul said it like this in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Listen to what Paul said to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9 and 10. For if they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. Watch this and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. One of the greatest things that we have as Christians is the anticipation of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is natural, it should be natural. If you're not looking for Jesus to come back, something's bad wrong with you, amen. I'm looking for him to come back more now than ever before. I've heard preaching about the second coming. I've heard preaching about the rapture from the time I was a little boy in church. And here I am now bumping 50. And I've never been this excited about Jesus coming back as I am today. I'm awaiting, anticipating the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if you're saved today, you ought to be looking for him to come back. Now, as I began to work on this message, I realized right quick there was no way I was going to be able to get it all in one message. I know you love it when I do that, but I have to unhook this afternoon and come back and finish this thing tonight. There's absolutely too much in here, unless you want to sit here for two and a half hours and let me preach the whole thing. It's six and one, half a dozen the other. Don't get mad at me. I get paid by the hour. It don't matter to me. Amen. But I tell you, as I begin working on this thought about waiting and anticipating the return of Christ. I just, so many verses and so many truths and so many doctrines and so many admonitions in the Bible are connected to this waiting. And I just want to say this this morning, that there's some things that we ought to be doing while we're waiting. But before we get into that list, I want to look this morning on why we're waiting. It's natural for us to look. It is, it, is a, it is a very clear in the scriptures that it's a natural thing for a believer to look for and anticipate the coming of Christ. But why? 
I want to give you three things this morning. I doubt I'll get past the introduction. If we do, if we do, fine. If we don't, fine. We'll just unhook and come back tonight. But there's at least three reasons I want to give you this morning on why we are looking for his return. By the way, here at Calvary Baptist Church, we do preach in the bodily return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There are people that deny that. They don't believe that. They, they don't believe that truth, that fundamental truth, but we do. And this morning, I'm gonna give you reasons why. First of all, we're looking for his return because of the hope that has been promised. God has given us multiple places in the word of God that we can turn to for a hope and an assurance that this world is not our home, we're just passing through, amen. Jesus is coming again, aren't you thankful for that? When we were, when we were members at Tabernacle down in Greenville where Brother Sudley is, they used to sing that song just about every single Sunday morning, Jesus is coming again, amen. Do they still do that? Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, but, but very soon Jesus is coming again. And Dr. Seidler would sing that and he would dedicate to that to the senior saints. Well, I'm not a senior saint yet, but I'll take that hope any day of the week, amen, over the world's hope and what the world's trying to offer. And the Bible in our passage of scripture, in our text here tonight, multiple places in our text, we find references to this hope of his return. Look back at verse number 17. It talks about if children then heirs, heirs and then joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified Together, we know that that is something that we can look forward to as Christians and hope of that glorification process. And then in verse number 18, it talks about, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There's another uh, 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 word of verse there talking about the hope that we have, the reason why we can with it joy and anticipation look for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Again, in verse number 19, he talks about the earnest expectation, not just an expectation, but an earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. And then in verse number 20, he uses that word at the end, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. And then you get to verse number uh, 21. It says that because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. All these verses that give us a biblical reason to have a hope in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number uh, 21. It talks about, uh, not only it talks about the, the creature itself shall be delivered, but it talks about being delivered into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And then he goes down in verse number 23 and he says that we are waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. And then in verse number 24, we find the word hope mentioned three times. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, uh, but that uh, what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And that's four times. I homeschool, but I can count. We have a hope. We're looking forward to something in the future and that something is the bodily return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It has been promised. Look at verse number 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So all through these verses, we find we have a biblical reason. And these are, this is just one passage of scripture. There are many others that we can look at and that we will look at. But I'm grateful this morning that we have a hope and that hope is of Jesus coming back. And I look forward, to, I look for him every day. In fact, every time I see a cloud, I look, I look to see if that's the cloud he's coming back on. I said, preacher, why do you say that? Because in Acts chapter number one, they were standing there on top of that mountain and they were watching Jesus ascend up into heaven. The Bible says in Acts 1 verse 10, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as they went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. There's another promise from the scriptures that we can lean on to know that Jesus is coming again. And I'm grateful for that hope this morning. Seems like every time a politician stands up behind a microphone, they try to give some kind of a speech to fill their potential voters of hope, and it's just depressing. Yeah. It's just depressing. And, 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 and a few years ago, we had a man run for office for the White House. His slogan was hope and change. 
There wasn't a whole lot of hope. There was a lot of change, but it wasn't a good kind. The world's definition of hope and what the world offers doesn't compare to the hope that we have as believers. I'm grateful this morning for the hope that has been promised unto us. We're looking for his return because of the hope that's been promised. But secondly, we are looking for his return because of the hold on us that has been painful. <laughs> Look at our text. Look at what it says in verse number 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. The bondage of corruption. Look at verse 22. For we know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Paul described our current situation as a bondage of corruption. Now, I don't want you to be confused or think that there is some sort of a contradiction from verse number 15 where he says, ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption. But then you get over to verse number 21 and he talks about the creature he says, talks about being delivered from the bondage of corruption. I believe he's talking about two different kinds of bondage here. There's a bondage that is on our physical man, our body, our, our flesh. And there's a bondage in verse number 15 that he's talking about that has been broken because of salvation. The spiritual bondage that we were in has been broken. We're no longer in chains as far as that is concerned. But I think we would all agree this morning that Paul's description of our physical man being in a bondage of corruption Corruption is a pretty good way to put it. In fact, as I was reading the scriptures, I recognized that all of creation, according to verse number 22, all of creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together. When God created the world in Genesis chapter number one, it was perfect. And everything he did was absolutely, you couldn't improve on it. In fact, it was so good, the Bible says that the Lord looked at it and he said, it's good. It's good. He created the plants and said it's good. He created all the animals and said it's good. He created man and said it's not good. Amen. For a man to be alone. Uh, but everything he created was perfect. It was perfect. And then sin came. And then the curse came. And then the thorns and the thistles and the, the pain and the suffering and all those things came on creation. And from that day till now, Apostle Paul says the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And I know that there are physical elements that are being alluded to in these verses. In fact, I woke up this morning and I was trying to remember, was I in a car crash yesterday? I was hurting all over. Anybody ever wake up in the morning and you're hurting and you don't know how you got to hurting? I'm trying to think, did I fall off the house? Why am I hurting? I'm hurting in places I didn't even know I had places. I'm serious. I got up this morning and I limped to my closet trying to figure out why is my left foot hurting so bad? What did I do to it? I didn't do anything. I went to bed. I went to bed and I woke up and I was hurting. My back was hurting. My foot was hurting. Anybody else? Come on, help me out now. I went to the chiropractor yesterday. I said, Doc, I'm falling apart. I'm falling apart. He said, well, we'll see if we can't get you put back together. I don't think there's enough duct tape and bungee cords to put us back together. I'm talking about the physical elements that are being referred to, our bodies being in pain, our physical bodies, and we could just go on and on. In 2 Corinthians chapter number four, I want you to turn over there right quick. I'm going somewhere with this, just bear with me. 2 Corinthians chapter number four, look at what Paul said in verse number 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Are y'all following me? We got the outward man, you got the physical man. We've got our body, and then we've got our spiritual man. Those are two different things. You understand that, don't you? Our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And he goes on, talks about looking at those things which are seen, verse number 18, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Another word, another verse about this hope that we have. Look at what it says in chapter five, verse number one, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. He's talking here about our physical body. 
groaning. He's talking about our outward, our physical tabernacle here. And he goes on and on. And we could just go and talk about it in the following verses. But what I want to say this morning is this. As I was reading our text back in Romans chapter number 8, I realized that Paul was not only talking about just our physical body as far as aches and pains might be concerned, but I believe he was talking about something much deeper. I think he was talking about the painful hole that we have with this bondage of corruption, this sin that we have to contend with on a daily basis. Now, you might not have to contend with it on a daily basis, but I do. And the apostle Paul did as well. In fact, he went into great detail back in chapter number seven as he began to talk about the the physical aspects of the struggle that you and I as Christians have. We're talking about why we're waiting, why we're looking for Jesus to come back. And it's because of this bondage of corruption that you and I have to deal with on a daily basis. Look at what he says in chapter number seven. Are you there? Romans seven. Look at verse number 17. Paul says, now then it is no more I Well, let's go to verse 14. Let's look at verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. We're talking about this conflict between our physical man and our spiritual man. We're talking about this fleshly tabernacle versus this this, uh, this, this, uh, spirit, spiritual man that was quickened and made alive when we got saved. It's real. The struggle is real. And it's aggravating. Can I get a witness? This sin nature, this struggle that we have. You say, preacher, if you're saved, you shouldn't have to fight that sin nature. Yes, you do. You do have to fight it. And that's what we're talking about in, verse, in our text. He went on to verse number 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. This is Apostle Paul. Now, if, you don't, if, if, if this isn't described, you're, you're a Christian walk, you're more spiritual than Paul. Let's keep going. If I, verse 16, if then I do that, which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Sin that dwelleth in me. He goes on in verse number 23, and he says, he talks about the law that wars in my members. He says in verse number 21, I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Even when we're doing things that are right, when we're doing things that God wants us to do, when we're trying to obey the Holy Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and we're trying to fulfill the will of God, even while that is happening, constantly lurking in our hearts and in our minds and in our members is the flesh and sin trying to rob us of that blessing by allowing us to even do the right thing with the wrong motives. Do the right thing for the wrong reasons. And the whole time we're trying to do right, evil is present with us. He said in verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. My inward man, my new man, that new creature that is in me as a result of the regenerating power of Jesus Christ gets excited about the law of God. My inward man does, but my outward man don't like it a bit. Not one bit. Verse 23, for I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. There's a struggle. There's a battle that takes place between the natural man and the spiritual man. Is everybody still with me? I can preach on a lot of things this morning, but I don't think there's a one of us in here this morning that don't need to hear this. Every single one of us that are in here struggles with our flesh Our our, our inner man is at war with our outer man. The the new man is at war with the old man. Our our flesh is at war with our spirit. And it's exhausting. It's exhausting. At least it is for me. Now, some people just succumb to it. (laughs) If you're not fighting the flesh, then you're not in a battle. You're just doing whatever you want to do. You're probably not all that tired. But some people are tired from fighting their flesh all day, every day. It's exhausting, mentally exhausting. The Apostle Paul, I was reading these verses, and if I'm not careful, I'll get distracted, but the Apostle Paul made several uh, 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 references to this struggle between his flesh and his spirit. In, in our text, in verse number five, I'm in chapter seven, verse number five, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members 
to bring forth fruit unto death. The motions of sin, the desires of sin was there. He talked about the motions of sin, sinful motions in verse number five. He talked about the sinful mind in verse number 23. Sinful mind. You say, how is it possible for a child of God to have a sinful mind? Because our mind, our brain has to be washed and it has to be renewed. Romans chapter number 12, verse one and two, uh, he talks about uh, being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he says in Philippians, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And he talks about strongholds. He talks about pulling down strongholds and tells us what to think on. Why? Because our brain didn't get saved. You do know that, don't you? I just preached last week about the Bible says when you're fasting and praying that you don't uh, abstain from one another for too long lest you fall into the temptations of Satan while you're fasting and praying. Tell me the devil don't work in your mind. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights and that's when the devil moved in and started tempting him. And he'll use your mind Paul talked about the motions of sin in verse five. He talks about the, the mind of sin in verse 23. He talked about the members of sin in verse number 23. I see another law of my members. The very hand, listen to me, the very hand that the Spirit of God could lead to hand somebody a gospel track is the very same hand that could shoot drugs up before you go to bed. Huh? The same eyes that we use to read the perfect word of God could be the same eyes that we look at, use to look at pornography or some kind of filth and the very same mouth that we use to issue blessings, the Bible says, can at the same time issue cursings. Why do you think James said, my brother, these things ought not so to be? Our members, there's a battle in our members our eyes, our ears, our hands. I preached to Brother uh, Patton during that ordination about the body. And I went right down to, from the top of the head all the way to the bottom of the feet, the battles that we, that, that, that we rage. I say, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying I'm excited about Jesus coming back because there's a hold on me that is painful and I'm looking forward to that bondage of corruption being broken. Amen. I'm looking forward to not having to get up in the morning and fight the flesh every day. I'm looking forward to being able to live my life without trying to guard my eyes and protect my mind, protect my ears. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. It ought to be exhausting. You ought to be fighting. I hope you are. I believe the Apostle Paul is talking about the enmity between the carnal mind and God, look at, I'm in chapter eight of Romans. Look at what it says in verse number seven, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Carnal mind. And while you're trying to use your mind for the things of God, the devil attacks your mind. I just want to ask for a show of hands. Ain't nobody here but us. Anybody in here ever have your mind attacked by Satan when you're on your knees trying to pray. That's a good sign that you're getting somewhere when you're praying if the devil's attacking you while you're praying. I'm telling you, we're talking about the, the carnal mind is enmity against God. And he goes on in verse number eight, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you and I, listen to me, if you and I are not spirit filled, let me just let this soak in just a second. If you wake up tomorrow morning and you do not start your day out spirit-filled, go ahead and mark this down, you cannot please God. You cannot. There's not one single thing that you and I can do in the flesh that impresses God. And so we live our Christian life with this bondage of corruption, this hold on our physical man, our flesh, our mind, our members. Everything is at war and it is exhausting. And that is one reason why we wait with earnest expectation for the manifestation of the, of the sons of God because of this hold that is on us so that we can have finally enter into his eternal rest. I'm... I, I'm, I'm struggling this morning.
to feel like I'm communicating the, the point that I'm trying to make. I don't want anybody in here this morning to feel like you're the only one that is struggling. I'm opening up to you this morning. I'm exhausted. Amen. Amen. The spiritual warfare that wages against my mind and against my heart is exhausting. Now, if you're here this morning and you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'll buy you steak tomorrow and you can sit there and tell me all about it. I want to hear. I want to hear how you have somehow or another managed a level of spirituality and Christianity where you're not having to deal with the temptations of Satan like Jesus did and like Paul did and like the rest of us do. Let me tell you something. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was God in the flesh. Okay, so I'm preaching about something right now. I'm walking out here on a limb. He was God in the flesh. Was he not? And he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. So I feel silly saying he was as close to God as you can get because he was God. But I don't know how else to say it. He was setting an example to us of how we get close to God and how we experience God's power and presence in our life. Jesus said it like this to his disciples, this kind of power. Talking about the, the power to cast out devils. Remember that when he came down off the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples couldn't help that man. He couldn't help his little boy. And they said, Lord, why couldn't we? He said, because this kind of comes only by prayer and fasting. Okay. So it's really hard for me to try to explain why God in the flesh whew, needed to fast and pray to have more power. But I'm just going to leave it out there with that right there. Okay. I'm in over my head. All right, somebody won't throw me a lifeline, I'll take it. But he was so tired and so weak physically. The devil moved in on him and started tempting him. And after just three temptations, it took so much a toll on him. The Bible says that God sent angels to minister to him. Right. Right. Huh? God looked down and saw his son in a time of vulnerability. Even though he couldn't sin, he was being tempted. Y'all bear with me. I don't know why I preach stuff that's over my head. It makes me look like an idiot. He couldn't sin, but he was being tempted to sin. Am I right? He had to fight. He had to submit to God and resist the devil. He had to show us. And he had to experience it because we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He had to go through it so he could identify with us when we go through it. But he was so weak and he was so feeble and he was under such a satanic attack that God sent angels to minister to the Son of God. So don't sit there this morning with your nose up in the air acting like you don't fight and struggle. I know I do. And I get tired of it. That's one reason why I love church so much. <laughs> this is one of the places where I can come and get a little bit of a break. God ministers to me, strengthens my inner man. Helps my spiritual man and my, my inner man be able to overcome the temptations of the battle and the war in my mind and in my members. And I don't know anybody that's serious about their relationship with God that's not exhausted. Exhausted. Ultra, whole creation grown and travailing in pain. My back's killing me this morning, but my back ain't my biggest problem. My biggest problem is between my ears. Amen. Come on now. Amen. My biggest problem is my flesh. Yeah. Number three. Is everybody all right? Are we still on track? Why are we waiting? Why are we waiting? We're not waiting number three because of the home that's been prepared. <laughs> Man, I'm looking for heaven, aren't you? Mm. 
That second verse, that choir song, sheltered in the arms of God. How's that second verse start off, Brother Adriel? Soon I shall hear a call from heaven's portal. Come home, my child. It's the last mile you must run. <laughs> when they were singing that loud, I come out of my chair. Woo! I got a song in my Bible. I've been singing it for two weeks. Supper time. I'm longing for him to, I'm, I'm longing for God to stick his head out the back door. Come on now. Stick his head out that screen door on the back porch and say, hey, hey, supper's on the table. Y'all come on in. Yeah. Praise God. I can't wait till it's supper time. When I was out in the yard playing as a boy, I couldn't wait for mama to say, it's time to eat. She ain't got to call me but one time. My wife ain't got to call me but one time. I'm standing there chafing, waiting on the kids. Where's the kids? Where's the kids? Where's the kids? I'm ready to pray and eat. You ain't got to call me but one time. One of these days, he's going to call us home. And we're going we're gonna to chuck this robe of flesh and we're going to have a glorified body. And for the first time, we're going to know what it feels like to be sinlessly perfect. And I'm going to, hey, I've got, a, I've got a home on the other side that don't need painting. There's nothing, the gutters don't need to be cleaned. Front porch don't need to be pressure washed. Flower beds don't need to be weeded. Come on now. Carpet don't need to be shampooed. I walk, I walk through my house and I see stuff needs to be done. And I say to myself, self, you need to fix that one of these days. I'm thankful as a child of God. Look at what he said in verse 21. Because of the creature itself also, I'm in chapter 8, Romans 8. For the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Yeah. Verse number 23, he says, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Oh, yeah. Come on. <laughs> oh my word. I'm looking for that day. See, it's important this morning as we close that you understand this, if you're here, that not everybody is going to heaven. There's a lot of people today, they think that this automatically when somebody dies, oh, they're in a better place. They're in a better place. Not if they wasn't saved or not. I was watching an old cowboy movie yesterday or Friday cowboy and the Indian. Indian chief got shot. He lay in there dead with his fringed buckskin on, war paint. Guy walked over and looked at him and said, well, he's experiencing peace for the first time. I looked at my wife. I said, if he wasn't saved, he ain't. Right. Right. Now, that's me. I can't even watch a cowboy movie stand without preaching. I mean, <laughs> got to fix all that doctrinal heresy. Amen. Huh? If he wasn't saved, he ain't experiencing peace. He's in a place called hell where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Amen. You say, well, I'm not an Indian in war paint on. No, you might be a Baptist church member faking it, faking it. And two seconds after you die, you're going to realize you faked something that you could have had for free. Why? Why would anybody fake being a Christian? Well, you can have it for free. Yeah. And it's ten times, it's a hundred times better, real, than it is the fake version. Yes, Come on now. I was talking about that struggle between the flesh and the spirit. If you're faking it and you're not saved, you ain't got a snowball's chance of winning. Because right. Right. you don't have a new man. That's right. Amen. Your spirit hadn't been quickened. You're trying to fight temptation and you're a child of hell, a child of Satan. Right. And for those of us that are saved, we've got a home on the other side. Amen. And Jesus said to his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. John 14, one, you believe in God, believe also in me and my father's house, our many mansions. Amen. If it were not so, I would have told you. I was looking at the, looking at the real estate market in this town 
I'm not in the market to buy a house, by the way, so don't come to me after service. I'm not selling my house. Everybody's like, oh, you can sell your house right now and you can make a bunch of money. I said, yeah, and then I'd be looking for a house and I don't want to be looking for a house. I like where I live and I like my house and I ain't selling my house. I'm not selling it. But I do need, I do need, I do stand corrected. I am in the market for a new house. <laughs> Just not one down here. <laughs> and I got one. It's a mansion. Oh my goodness, it's a mansion. Oh my goodness. It's a mansion. It's got a big old yard. Those of y'all from Dundalk, you know what that is, don't you? Yard. That's real estate wrapped around your house. <laughs> With no fence and no, no soliciting signs and no beware dog signs and it don't have any pizza and subway flyers stuck in the fence. Come on now. Can I get a witness? It don't have a broken sidewalk out front that you have to shovel every time it snows. I'm in the market for a new house. He's building me one. It's a mansion. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself to where I am. There you may be also. And whether I go, you know, in the way you know. Thomas said, Lord, how can we know the way? We know not without goes. How can we know the way? Here's what Jesus said. I'm the way. You want a mansion in heaven? You want a home that's been prepared? Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Preacher, I'm a good person. Preacher, I, I got baptized when I was a kid. Preacher, I, I did this. I, I joined the church. That's, none of that matters. None of that matters when it comes time for you to die. He's not going to ask to see your baptismal certificate. He's not going to ask to see the church clerk know where you went to church. He's not going to ask to see all your good deeds and put them on one side of the scale and your bad deeds on the other side. That makes a great visual image, but that's not in the Bible. That's not how it works. What I'm saying this morning is if Jesus comes back and you're not saved, we're out of here, you're left here. You're left behind to go through the horrors of the tribulation. You're here to deal with the deception of the Antichrist. You are here to experience the wrath of God on earth and then when you die, it's been eternity in a place called hell if you're not saved. All the Bible believing men of God will be gone. All the Christians will be gone. All the true churches will be gone. All will be left as deceivers. Come on now. I'm looking for Jesus to come back. I didn't even get into my message. That was just the introduction. I'm waiting for him to come back. Now, if you're here this morning and you're not saved, you're not excited about Jesus coming back. You're not excited about Jesus coming back if you're not saved. But you can get excited before you leave here if you get saved. If you're a child of God this morning, you ought to be looking forward to Jesus coming back. You ought to be excited about Jesus coming back. Now, I want you to come back tonight. we got some points I want to give you about things we ought to be doing while we're waiting. You don't want to miss that. But for now, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. There may be somebody sitting in this service right now. You say, Pastor Shifflett, if Jesus were to come back right now, sound the trumpet and rapture the church out of here, I would be left behind because I have not been born again. Would you be honest enough with God this morning? Would you be sincere enough this morning and concerned enough about your soul this morning to just quietly slip your hand up where I can see it? so that I can pray for you. Anybody, anywhere, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. While she's playing, would you slip your hand up so we could see it? It would be our greatest honor this morning to take a Bible and help you. I see that hand, God bless you. Anybody else, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure where I'm going when I die. We would love to take a Bible and help you with that this morning. If you're watching online, there's a phone number on the screen. Text that number, say, I need to talk to somebody. We'll call you in just a few minutes with a Bible and do everything we can to help you over the phone. There may be somebody here this morning and say, Preacher, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. There's no question in my mind that I'm saved. I remember the time and the place. I know I'm saved, but I'm not where I ought to be with God. And I appreciate you preaching this morning about Jesus coming back. I want to be ready for him when he comes. Would you slip your hand up, anybody? Hands are going up, hands are going up, hands are going up. Hands are going up all over the church. God bless you. Thank you for being honest and for being sensitive. Listen, we've got folks praying all over the service. Let's do this. I just want everybody to stand. 
you stand if you would, just keep your heads bowed, but I want us to all stand across the building. There may be somebody who needs to slip out and get in the altar. Be easier for them to get out if everybody's standing up. Just look at the person beside you and say, excuse me, I need to go pray. There's folks down here praying. There's folks down here right now talking to God. Would you join them? If you raised your hand, you're not sure that you're saved or if you're not where you ought to be with God, right now is a good time for you to get that taken care of.